Hi, Jamie. Hi. How are you? We might have to bring you to our upfront to talk about all of our content. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm available. I'm available to talk about the bear anytime. All right. Um, uh, we, have, we have cards. How, how, I don't have how cards. fancy. Have I know, cards. exactly. Um, so thanks for joining today. Um, obviously, you know, Disney's had a, a busy year. Um, what's been most impactful uh, for your business um, over the last year, and what's changed in your day to day? Um, you know, I think we're most proud of the success that we've seen in AVOD. I think as an industry, like the acceleration of AVOD mm -hmm. has been pretty incredible. I also like to your point about every second matters. Like if I think about like what the industry looked about, looked at, like when I started my career, it's totally different. And it's incredible. Like the fact that we all get to witness this change and be a part of changing the industry. Yeah. So if I think about it right now, like AVOD changing, definitely incredible. What I'm most excited about is when we look at the, the fact that consumers are accepting ads. Again, they're not gonna just accept any ads, it has yeah. to be a good ad, but consumers are accepting them. We see this through data. Like I see now if I look um, Disney Plus, when consumers are signing up, 50% of them are choosing the ad supported tier. Mm -hmm. The other thing that surprised us and we were happy about is we're seeing increased engagement. So our engagement is up 35%. So once we're getting a consumer in, they're there, they're engaged and they're spending time. Yeah. So I think that's very important. Um, we did have a big year, you know, rolling out Disney Plus mm -hmm. has been incredible. You know, we say that we have like a teenager and a toddler <laughs> and like, how do you bring that together and, and make sure that you're taking the learnings from one to bring it over the other, but also understanding that they're different and mm -hmm. they're not the same children and you have to treat them different. Yep. So, you know, in the, in the US, um, Disney Plus rolled out, it wasn't an overnight rollout. We didn't just push it out there. We were thoughtful. We kind of listened to the market, saw what happened. We were also very thoughtful to make sure that we wanted to build an audience before we're adding in you know, targeting and the different features and functionality. Mm -hmm. um, enabling programmatic was very important for us. Um, you know, it's now enabled in 30 different um, DSPs. You were one of the first DSPs that actually helped us scale it, which was incredible to see. And then the same thing as rolling it out in EMEA and Canada, which we did in November. It was, again, it was taking some of what we learned, but also understanding that it is, you know, a global strategy, but it has to be localized to make sure that it's thoughtful in each of the markets. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I, I was really proud of the work that we did together last year on Disney Plus, especially uh, in the fourth quarter when we rolled out Biddable, because I think it really proved um, a lot of what you know I was talking about earlier, which is there's this desire to bring data to the table, and I think Disney's really embraced that, which is incredible. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. also you know the speed in which both of our companies yeah. came together. I thought was pretty amazing because mm -hmm. it was rolled out on the Disney Ad Server, new technology, new right. capability, and it really was like taking all the data that we could and daily phone calls like the win rate's up, this is down. What do we, like, you know, it's making sure that we're figuring it out together. Mm -hmm. um, so advertisers won. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, Disney's, Disney's unique in that you have this really vast portfolio of consumer touch points, whether it's parks, whether it's your content, whether it's sports, what, whatever it is, you know, you've got so many different consumer touch points. And so what, I think what results from that is you've got this, you know, generations really of consumer loyalty. I mean, Disney celebrated their 100 year anniversary last year, I think, right? And so you've got literally generations of con customer loyalty and fandom. So how do you think about that relationship with the consumer in terms of where that intersects with technology and how does that play a role in terms of Disney's relationship with its consumers? I think that 10 years ago, Disney had the foresight to build our own identity graph to make mm -hmm. sure, again, that we're being thoughtful in the way that we connect with our consumers. If we look at what it's enabled from an advertising perspective, you know, it does two things which I think are amazing. Um, the first, and we'll talk about UID2 mm -hmm. later in this conversation, mm -hmm. but it enables scale. So whatever audience anyone wants to target, it, it gives us audience scale. And I think that that's the use case that everyone talks about when you're talking about identity and clean rooms. It's always about like audience scale, audience scale, audience mm -hmm. scale for targeting. But I think the use case that is you could argue more important is the scale for measurement on the back end mm -hmm. because you want to make sure that the data you're using on the back end is accurate. Yeah. So us having a graph means that when we're passing data back, the match rates are high. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, doing running a campaign, then doing attribution off of a 10% match rate and scaling it up. Mm -hmm. We're making sure that the match rates from an attribution standpoint are 80, 90% to make sure that the data you're getting back, you can actually use. So yeah. I feel like the foresight to build an identity graph, 
parlayed into clean rooms, everything privacy focused to get the most out of it for our advertisers. I, I think the build component to that is really interesting, right? Because you have this incredible value exchange with the consumer and you're really leveraging that because you have such incredible content and then taking that to then apply that to advertisers I think is just incredible. Um, that commitment to technology is maybe a good segue to talk about your tech showcase. So I remember the first one uh, in, in 2021. Um, I got to participate in it. Barnes and I, I think we're out in New Jersey uh, at that one, uh, uh, filming something. Um, and, and it's really just become an, an incredible event. Um, um, uh, so if you fast forward to this year, you guys hosted the Tech Showcase at CES. It was the fourth one in Las Vegas. Um, and just the progress, I think, that both our industry and our partnership has seen over that time is just astounding. I mean, you even said in January that you're not slowing down. So can you talk about the importance of the Tech Showcase and, and why that's become such an important milestone for Disney on an annual basis now? Yeah, I mean, Disney's been very vocal about you know building our own tech stack. You know, we believe that building our own tech stack allows us to go faster. It allows us to listen to advertisers and kind of move priorities around versus being reliant on other um, third parties. But we also want to be interoperable with the ecosystem and make sure that we are partnering in ways also. I never want technology to be a reason why you can't buy Disney. We want to make sure that all the pipes are connected to so wherever you want to buy, you can. Tech and Data Showcase was in Vegas. It was very purposeful. We did it there because you know, we talk a lot about our content. I don't think people realize and talk about the technology that we're enabling. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that the marketplace had kind of insights to all the advancements that we are creating from a technology standpoint and all the investments that we're making for advertisers. We purposely picked to do it at CES because what better place to do it <laughs> than, you know, the epicenter of technology. And for us, the significance of the Tech and Data Showcase is really, um, it's a kick, up, kick off to our upfront season. And we start to let clients know the innovations that are out there. We start to kind of get feedback. The strategic conversations kick off then. Mm -hmm. And that like leads us right into the upfront season. Yeah, it was incredible. I, lo I loved the event this year um, at CES. What was your favorite announcement? Not to put you on the spot. Favorite but announcement? But you have I cards mean, and I don't, so I feel yeah, like yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a good segue to our next question, because one of the things you talked about <laughs> in Someone's that conversation. I know. Great segue, exactly. These cards are in great order. <laughs> uh, but, Meanwhile, the cards are blank. Just <laughs> that's right. There's nothing in the answer. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, one of the things you guys did talk about the tech showcase uh, was retail. And I know our next panel is going to talk a lot uh, about retail and deep dive into that, but I loved hearing this. Um, but I'd love to hear from you why Disney's leaning into partnerships with retailers and why that was a, a big focus of what you guys talked about at Tech and Data this year. Yeah, so everything that we do, we want to make sure is adding to the experience for the viewer, right? It's always mm -hmm. a viewer first experience. Yep. If I kind of like look back at my career, like I spent, you know, the earlier part of my career really focused on set-top box addressable. And one of the things that I always saw was that, and you said it in your opening, that premium content matters. Yeah. So if you take premium content like we have at Disney and then you pair it with retail media data, mm -hmm the advertiser is going to win. Yeah. I think we're very proud of what we've already enabled with you guys. I mean, mm -hmm. we have about 15 different retail media networks that are already enabled across any um, category. And when you're taking the premium nature of our content and you're taking data like that, everyone wins. The other thing is, you know, we are always thinking about how to innovate in our ad experiences. And we don't want to take people away from the content. We want to add. So if you're you know, watching a, sh uh, a commercial and you want to like buy that product, we want to be able to, in as little clicks as possible, take you there. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is interesting is you know, shop the stream we talked about. Mm -hmm. So like, again, that's like you're watching a show. You want to buy the shirt. You want to buy the cooking supplies. It's like, how do you bring it, how do you bring it there? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's like another evolution of it. And then we also talked about um, Disney's magic words. Each of the holding companies has already agreed to that they want to beta this with us. And this is really like you're watching a scene and the way that you're able to connect is by taking the different kind of emotions and then serving it in. So like think about like food and food culture and like mm -hmm. how do you connect with someone in a different way? Mm -hmm. And I think it's all about like how do you create that immersive experience that's gonna add versus take away? 
That's cool. The bear would be a good. You love the bear. That, you know, just just saying. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, I remember being at your upfront last year um, um, uh, over at the Javits Center, and uh, I remember walking up and talking to you and everybody at at the end because it was right on the heels of your of your earnings, and we were talking about uh, having listened to that call, and and Bob Iger said talked about programmatic advertising uh, on your earnings call right around your upfront, and then he kicked off your tech and data showcase this year as well. So um, when you think about automation and addressability and the work that we've done as partners over, over the years, you know, what's evolved the most that yeah. you've seen? Um, I would say like the, I sit like in an open floor plan with the programmatic team mm. and I've never seen the team happier than when Bob Iger said programmatic three times on an earnings call. <laughs> like people were like high fiving. Um, so it was pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, for us, like the way that we think about it, we've been very kind of vocal on our journey to automation. The reason why we want to create automation is to make it easier to buy Disney. We want to make sure that we're creating operational efficiencies, that you're not waiting two weeks for us to turn around a plan, and we could create it through automated channels. Hmm. The way that we kind of think about it um, is, you know, Disney is kind of like a storefront, and you can come in and you can buy through different channels, whether it's through our self-service platform or it's through programmatic. Mm -hmm. We do believe that the future is, you know, automating the business to create mm -hmm. better service for our clients. But, um, we are at 50% of automation. When I started, that number was a lot smaller. I've only been here for a year and a half, and mm -hmm. we were about 30% or you know, when I started, and now we're wow. at 50%. Rita's been very vocal that by 2027, we'll have 75% of the business automated. And for us, it's really, it's about making sure that it's easy to buy as possible. Um, for us, interoperability isn't just a word. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the pipes are actually connected so people can buy in the way that they want to buy. Interoperability means, you know, like, like I said before, targeting for data and measurement, but also too, like from an ad innovation standpoint, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that when we go beyond the 30, if you guys want to buy a, you want to buy a Brightline unit or a Curve unit or wherever you want to buy, that you can buy it across all of our marketplaces and across all publishers. Yeah, that's incredible. I love the 75% goal over the next couple of years. You know, you mentioned you've been here um, at Disney for a year and a half. Um, what, what's or what do you think has changed the most? So you said you've, when you got here, it was in the 30s. Now you're in 50. You have a goal to be at 75. Like, what, what have you observed just in your, you know, 18 plus months at Disney? Like, what's evolved the most in terms of? I, mean, I would credit it all to the trade desk. Oh, <laughs> that, I didn't. I didn't ask. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, like in a world of like accelerated fragmentation and it just keeps mm. happening and the world is going so fast, I think that everyone is really leaning more into technology yeah. because that's really the only way that you can, you know, aggregate audiences at scale, um, start to make sense of the reach frequency across all the different publishers to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, you're buying one publish for reach, one for frequency, and it all kind of comes together. Yeah. So I think it's just acknowledging um, that the world has changed, that we need different tools and that, you know, you, if 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 a client calls and says like, hey, I want to plan for this, and you're gonna, you know, be relying on waiting for someone to, you know, two weeks to do a plan, like you're gonna have a very unhappy client. So yeah. I just think that we're all leaning in, um, and as everything's like, there's no other option. Right. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about sports. Um, so obviously, you know, ESPN is a huge priority for Disney, um, both for live and the show surrounding it, things like sports center and NFL countdown, March madness, et cetera. Um, you've got, you're so well positioned across the leagues and just all of the content. You had over 150,000 games on ESPN last year, which uh, that's incredible. H how do you think about sports and streaming and where that intersects uh, with programmatic and automation in terms of an opportunity for advertisers? Um, streaming and sports, I think it, like you said, it creates the opportunity for more, mm. right? So it gives that choice and control to the viewer to be able to access the content that they want to watch. Um, if we look at the stats on, like, I looked at it yesterday, year over year, NFL streaming is up 40%, right? Mm -hmm. So people are discovering the content, they're finding it. I think the announcement that we made a couple weeks ago with some of, you know, other partners in the marketplace around the sports JV, I think, mm -hmm. is like, if you think about what ESPN has always said our mission is, and it's like putting the sports fan first. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times I've watched my husband try to find a game and Googling where it is and yelling that we don't have the subscription right. and that, you know, it's the <laughs> whole thing. So I think that was like the first signal that we're starting to figure it out and come together to put the viewer first. Right. Um, I also think too, 
you know, it's also about, for, with ESPN, it's about like creating immersive experiences and sur surrounding the uh, sports fan in different and innovative ways. And how do you go beyond the 30 to be more thoughtful? I thought what mm -hmm. we did with Toy Story mm -hmm. was pretty cool, right? So like yeah. Toy Story, it was a simulcasted game. The same time that the NFL game was running, you saw the Toy, Toy Story characters were actually playing the game. So like, think about that, like just like a moment of fandom yeah. to be able to sit with your kid and explain football and in the world of Pixar is like a, just a different mindset. So I think expect like more of that, um, more kind of immersive experiences that kind of ignite fandom. Yeah, and, and being able to just leverage all, all of the different portfolio assets that you have at Disney to like create those intersections. Yeah, or, and then or, easier for the viewer yeah. to consume and find. Or universes like the Marvel Universe. Um, so another area that, that we've talked a lot about in our partnership that you guys have really leaned into uh, is on identity. So uh, about two years ago, which is hard to believe, you know, we announced uh, our partnership on UID2, which is a, a huge, huge focus this year for so many people in this room, uh, especially with the um, uh, announcement uh, around cookies. So even if that's, um, uh, you know, not necessarily directly applicable to TV, the cookie announcement, but um, why was that so important for Disney? And what have you guys learned uh, in terms of that partnership that we have, and broadly speaking, on identity uh, over the last couple of years since we launched I mean, together? I think it's important, like not only for Disney, it's important for the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And again, it all comes back down to having true interoperability. We have the benefit of having our own graph. Mm -hmm. What's nice about having our own graph is like we are not reliant on the signal of another graph. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to match, right, and make yep. sure that we're increasing match rates as high as possible. So for for us, you know, adopting UID2 to see a match rate go up three, four times and to be able to tell an advertiser, like, you can now reach this much more scale of qualified audiences, you know, I think it helps them achieve their goals as well. Mm -hmm. um, if not, it was like you were leaving like an you were leaving the audience on the table if you couldn't actually right. reach them. Yeah, those connections are so powerful and that, that exponential um, reach that you can find when you have th this incredible asset, which is you, ha you have authenticated viewers. And then when you can combine that with your graph and then interoperable um, signal like UID2, you just expand the audience so tremendously and create an amazing opportunity for advertisers. Yeah. And it's then, been, uh, yeah, it's like, been like you started at the top, yeah. premium content matters. Then when mm -hmm. you're taking the measurement piece of it and being able to actually have attribution and show that it's actually working and driving your business, I think is kind of the holy grail. That's amazing. So... Uh, to close out, and we only have about a minute left, um, we're asking everybody at the end of every session this question, so I yeah. hope you'll notice the theme uh, throughout the day. Uh, but what are you most excited about for the year ahead in television? So I would say, you know, adding in the layer of audience targeting paired with contextual relevance to drive that relevancy, make it a better experience for the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, I think is very, you know, kind of important as we kind of move forward. The other thing that I do, you know, hope starts to happen is all streaming isn't created equal. Some are going to drive reach, some are going to add frequency, and that's okay. But making sure that the buy side has the information to make informed decisions, that way their plans work harder. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Jamie. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. I, I can take my blank cards with me now, okay, and, and yeah, we can go. Thank you so much for right. joining us Thank today. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.